Hello everyone, welcome to History 104. I will be doing a lecture on the era of Reconstruction. Now this will be to supplement what you read in the chapter, just because I feel some subjects are probably, you know, very significant to address, but also um, I believe it doesn't talk about the lost cause. So I really want to touch on that because it plays a very important role in the way that the South looks at itself after the Civil War. Um, Another kind of key reason why I want to touch on this, uh, particularly focusing on African Americans, is because we are so detached from what people went through. And uh, there has been major improvements in the last 40, 50 years, right, with the civil rights movement of the 1960s. But some of these things still persist. They still linger in our culture. And in an era where, you know, we vote on, you know, on our cell phones for you know, TV shows and things like that, you would think that voting would become much easier. Uh, in fact, voting has become much more difficult for some uh, some people, whether you're white or, or black or Latino or Asian, right? So um, I want to kind of touch on certain subjects that are important that impact our culture today. So the past always impacts uh, who we are at this at any given moment. And um, really kind of, you know, we, we live in an era, too, where, you know, history has been shaped in a particular way to minimize uh, what people have gone through based on the things that we experience today. So there's this perception that certain groups get everything, right? And, and nothing could be further from the truth, you know? And, and there's this sense of, what about me? What about me? What about me? Um, you know, this person gets everything and I get nothing. And, and we see a lot with kind of um, extreme, um, kind of extremist groups. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you have these, these kind of neo-Nazi groups that feel like they've been disenfranchised. And there's a comedian named Chris Rock where he, he kind of makes fun of this point of, of kind of these, you know, kind of white supremacists saying, you know, oh, we're losing our country, we're losing our country. And he says, if you're losing, who's winning? Because we're not, right? So he makes a very kind of valid point, right? That um, there's this perception that minorities are getting, you know, all these things. In reality, they're not. But that's the way it's kind of presented, um, at least perceived by a group of of people. And, and we have to go back and kind of correct this from an academic sense. So if you do believe that, um, understand that you're in college, that you're in academia, you know, opinion is completely different from the research that we do. And this is why I think it's so key for me to address this, these particular points that I'll be touching on. Um, a lot of times we feel uncomfortable because um, it, it challenges what we've been taught, maybe by our parents, or maybe what we've seen. A lot of times, you know, what we call standpoint theory, we believe truth to be based off what we see. Uh, sometimes there's bigger factors that we don't see. And, and unfortunately, we cannot see beyond our own kind of self-interest. So we want to kind of really touch on, on those things, um, particularly when we look at history, because there are certain things that happened in the past that um, sometimes historians have neglected. And one of the things that I'm going to touch on is this idea of the lost cause, because I think our textbook um, either doesn't cover it or doesn't go into great detail. And I think it's important because the South has created this mythology about itself, so much so that people have bought into it, things like Southern Bells. And, and you know, and again, I'll, I'll dig a little bit deeper as we kind of move forward in this lecture. So we have to kind of go back as academics and challenge these things, all right? So you might believe these things, but like I said earlier, opinion is not fact, right? So we're going to look at the reconstruction and really the cost of freedom. And here we're focusing on African-Americans. <clears throat> and we're going to look at how they became, they became disenfranchised. And then the second part of this is how the South constructed a past of itself, right? And, and that's a key word, constructed. They create a myth of... Um, what Southern culture is about, even though technically it, you know, it didn't, doesn't exist, right? <clears throat> so let's begin 
So we begin by looking at, you know, some of the things that were very positive for African Americans, right? Uh, after the Civil War, you know, they obtained their freedom. Now, it's not there's a there's a major debate debate as to how did African Americans get their freedom? And I remember when I was in grad school, there's always this oh Lincoln gave it to them. <laughs> well, and and it, it's a very problematic kind of argument that somebody gives you something right because African Americans uh, have fought for this freedom right, and people outside of the African American com community has have also fought for. Um, <clears throat> you know, for um, their freedom too, right? We have a lot of abol abolitionists, right? Uh, and definitely we don't want to minimize Lincoln's role, but we have to kind of look at this, this kind of holistic. And this should be significant because a lot of times, you know, many of these uh, abolitionists or even poor whites have a lot in common with African-Americans. So there's this uh, idea that, you know, they, they could have built inroads with each other to build a more perfect union, which is the whole basis of our constitution, right? So we're going to look at some of these these uh, things that almost from a psychological perspective gave African-Americans a sense of uh, equality, even though they were not viewed as complete equals. Um, coming out of slavery, many of them saw certain things that were changing in the South as places of opportunity. So one of the key things that we see is this concept of land. <clears throat> Throughout uh, history, you know, most people depended on the land. I believe it's not until the 1900s where you begin to see a large, um, and, sorry, an equal split in the population where 50% live in the rural areas and 50% live in urban areas, which means, you know, um, you know, people live in cities and people live in the country. And, you know, during this period in particular, right, 18, uh, 60s and 70s, most people live in the rural areas, which means they're dependent on land. So like any other community, for African-Americans, this concept of land is very important because that's how you make your living at this time. Also, the South, it's not a very industrial community, right? So um, I think like close to 90% of it's still dependent on some form of agriculture. You know, they, they probably have less than 10% of um, industry in the South all the way up to 1900. So land is very key. And for many, oh, sorry, for many African-Americans, land is a way of life. So when they were um, promised by General William Sherman in the special field order uh, number 15, uh, that they would obtain land, they really believed this. So uh, General Sherman actually did set aside about 400,000 acres between Florida and South Carolina for African Americans. And because many of them did par participate in this conflict, and um, again, because they were slave and they, after the end of, of slavery, they expected, you know, um, to um, have their freedom they saw land as connected to that concept of freedom. So many of them saw that the wealth of the uh, plantation owners came through their labor. Uh, and there's a great quote that says, in the, the land which they hold, they meaning the plantation owners, right? The slave owners, was nearly all earned by the sweat of our brows, right? So it was African-American slaves who actually produced the cotton or the tobacco or whatever other product were being planted in these plantations. So they uh, saw that land as part of who they were, right? Connected to them. So many of them end up, um, during the war, many of them, you know, were, went, while their owners kind of left the plantations because of... Uh, the North was kind of um, gaining in this conflict. Uh, many of the slaves stayed in the plantations and they continued doing the work. So again, they had that kind of connection with the territory. Uh, education is another kind of important aspect of freedom for African-Americans. 
um, we see that the Freedmen's Bureau actually established 3,000 schools uh, for African Americans, uh, which is a major accomplishment. So throughout, you know, pre-Civil War, many African Americans did not have access to education. So many of them did not know how to read. And we see an increase in literacy from about 10% to about 30% by 19, or sorry, by 1875. So, you know, that, that is a major increase um, in literacy rates. Now, these, they're not very proficient, but nevertheless, just having access to education uh, gives them hope because even today we see education as the avenue towards better opportunities. And by the 1900s, we see about half the African-American population could read in some shape or form. <clears throat> we also see the establishment of black colleges. So we have a Howard University in, in Washington, D.C., where they train teachers, um, particularly black teachers, so they can go back into their community and teach young kids. And, and again, kind of hoping that they would follow in those steps and get educated too. And getting educated, um, there's this hope that you eventually enter politics. So we find that 70 former teachers in the South eventually leave education and run for political office. So that is a major step forward, right? Because now uh, African Americans have representation in the South. Now, again, this sounds kind of nice, but things will, will change as we move forward. Um, we also begin to see that by 1870, uh, African-American teachers begin to outnumber white teachers. So at the beginning, you do have white teachers teaching African-Americans. Um, but as the years go by, and again, by, the establish, by establishing these kind of um, African-American colleges, <clears throat> um, they get educated and they start going back into the community and, and teach. And um, again, you begin to develop a middle class of African-Americans. Another important institution that was very kind of critical to the african-american community is the black church so i'm not sure if anybody has ever gone to uh, uh african-american church I, I got the privilege to go one uh down by chase stadium uh, I think, i'm not sure it's still called chase stadium but downtown one, one of the kind of early african-american churches here and i think it was a two-hour I'm not sure if they call it a mass. Sorry, I'm Catholic. So, um, but anyways, it was two hours. So if you go to Catholic mass, it's like one hour. And I swear to God, I feel like it's never ending. But I went to this one, um, um, on a Sunday, I went to this one mass. And for two hours, oh my God, the time flew by. Before you knew it, it was it was over. And then there was food afterwards. And, and it was just so cool because um, everybody dressed up. And the Catholic church was wearing shorts and just t-shirts and whatever. It almost feels like they're going to the beach. Here, everybody at the African-American church that I went to, everybody was wearing, you know, proper clothing, you know, button-up shirts, suits, hats, which I thought was really cool, right? Um, they ask for your name, so they welcome you into into the, the, the church. They um, also mention your name, because if you're a first-time person attending it, uh, they announce your name and there's music and, and it's just really, really cool. A, a colleague of mine invited me to a sermon that she gave. So I thought it was really, really cool to see. Now in saying that, and, and why I bring this up, is because churches are a cornerstone of the African-American community, right? Everything happens there. So when we look at civil rights in the 1960s, it's almost connected to the church, right? These things kind of go hand in hand. So a positive aspect <clears throat> is that you have African-American ministers. Now that is key because prior to that, that's not to say that African-Americans did not attend church, but attended to, to attend um, a church that was controlled by Southern white ministers, which tended to justify slavery, right? They uh, obviously they have an interest in maintaining this kind of system of slavery, uh, not just for themselves, but for the community. So um, 
for many African Americans, obviously they did not like slavery. So this was the first time in where they can read uh, the church, uh, sorry, the Bible, and kind of challenge those ideas that African Americans are second class citizens, right? So a lot of the white ministers also promoted this kind of white supremacist kind of argument, right? That by nature, certain people are supposed to be below other people. And by having their own ministers, it, it begins to kind of challenge that type of rhetoric. Um, also, African-American uh, church is much more, uh, what they call more expressive and emotional worship style, right? That they follow. And, and like I used my example, right? A two hour mass seemed like a 40 minute <laughs> Um, whereas again, Catholic mass is just, well, you know, it's just long and boring, even though it's only one hour. And uh, I already mentioned that part of the community. Um, and then it, it allows different people, the community to take certain leadership roles, right? They learn how to organize, you know, even women play a very important role in the black church. So, um, they learn the skills of how to run an organization, which is something they, they did not have uh, in the slave system, right? Because it's, it's all controlled for them. Here, women, African-American women, have access to some power. And for men, many of them enter politics. So as you know, they become ministers, again, they're educated, um, they, they know how to read, they, they learn policy, and they um, are ministers, but also part of the um you know uh, part of the the southern politics so they enter politics and, and again it's no surprise in you know 100 years later with the civil rights movement that we see a lot of activism emerge from the black church okay. uh, when it comes to um, their legal standing we see that there's certain laws that are passed by the u.s government that benefits um really everyone, though obviously African Americans are going to benefit uh, quite a bit too because they have no status in the United States prior to this period, and now they do, right? So the Civil Rights Act that Congress passed made every U.S. born person a citizen. So even though Johnson vetoed it, Congress overrode his veto. And I think this is something the book talks about, so I won't spend too much time on that. But it is key to note is that Congress was kind of fearful of Johnson. Johnson uh, basically apologized for the South. A lot of his policies, you know, partly because he came from the South, but a lot of his policies kind of maintained the old order. So Congress, which was mostly Republican here, tried to uh, make sure that these laws would not be overturned, so they passed the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment is key because it does a few things. Number one, it can't be changed, right? Once it becomes an amendment, it makes it very difficult to change. Uh, another thing that it does is, is that it makes anybody, again, like, like the Civil Rights Act, made anybody in the U.S. born a citizen. It gave equal protection um, for African Americans, right? To actually to everyone, but you know, um, obviously it impacts African Americans. Um, it reduced representation in Congress if, stop, if states blocked uh, African Americans from voting. So if, you, um, if a state did not allow African Americans to vote, then it, it lowered um, you know, the, the amount of states uh, of reps that you could have in Congress. Now understand that once slavery ended, it gave the South more votes because under the uh, or sorry, more representation because under the the original um, constitution, you know, African Americans are, are only three fifths of a person, right? So um, they had some weight in regards to representation, but once they're free citizens, it gives them it gives the southern states a lot more representation. Now this could be positive and negative. It's, it's positive at the beginning because um, African Americans were voting, you know, voting in, in elections. But as we get into the 1870s, uh, all of a sudden they get, you know, the states get these larger representation um, um, like bodies. But uh, 
unfortunately, African Americans cannot vote. So, you know, the southern states get all the benefit without having to do much for civil rights. <clears throat> um, it also made sure to ban Confederates, particularly high ranking Confederates, from holding political office. This, you know, again, the attempt is there to limit that, but it um, doesn't always work. We see that the vice president of the Confederate States actually enters government. Um, but, you know, again, the, the 14th Amendment is attempting to correct some of the wrongs. And it prohibited, this is another kind of key point, prohibited financial compensation for the ex-slave owners. Uh, this is something that the South really fought for, that they felt that they should be compensated for the loss of their property. Um, I think there was some guy on Fox News who made this point. Uh, I think it's Judge Napolitano or something like that. That, oh, had Lincoln just paid off all these slave owners, you know, um, to free their slaves, we could have avoided this conflict. It's like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> it would have been way too expensive for one, but uh, the logic is just incorrect. When you have a, a population that's creating you money, well, why would you set them free, right? So it's such a stupid argument that, you know, that Fox commentator made. But um, this law prohibited uh, people paying, or uh, sorry, the, the state, you know, the, the United States paying ex-slave owners for doing something they shouldn't have done in the first place. Another key uh, piece of legislation is the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment gave um, the right to vote to anybody regardless of race. This was a contested issue because women, not just African-American women, but also um, white women, saw this as an opportunity for, for them to get the vote too. It, it would have been uh, amazing, right? It, it would have changed history. Uh, had they allowed uh, anybody to vote. And uh, there's a whole history to that. You can take my women's history. We, you know, we kind of touch on that. But um, I believe Frederick Douglass said, you know, this is the African-Americans hour right now. So let's focus on race. And um, this 15th Amendment only focus on, on um, men. But it gave um, all men the right to vote. <clears throat> and we see major progress happening again this is the promises this is the hope that african americans had and we find that for the most part african americans ten tended to be republicans right uh, because they're the ones who who supported the end of slavery and um, obviously lincoln was was a republican um uh too so it, 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 many african americans supported the Republican Party. Now understand that um, these political parties are very different from today. So to say that you're a Republican today means nothing in regards to history. Um, to say that you're a Democrat today doesn't mean that you're a Democrat in the 1870s. I mean, these, these political parties uh, changed, I won't say evolved, uh, but it changed. So it always becomes very problematic when people try to say a Republican today was the same as a Republican a hundred years ago, even a Republican, <laughs> a Republican 10 days ago or 10 years ago, right? Um, it's, it's very, very different. Um, but definitely a hundred years ago, it, it, it's almost like a Democrat. Uh, these parties kind of switch um, perspectives, if you will, because if you look at the Republicans back then, they were supporting like, what people today would call big government, basically. And you'll see that as we move to through this lecture addressing um, the lost cause, all right? But, um, you know, we do see African-Americans entering the political field. You know, between 1869 uh, and 1901, 22 African-Americans uh, enter the U.S. Congress. And then more than 600 um, are voted into state legislatures so uh, and other offices. So we do uh, see that they saw hope with, you know, with Reconstruction and obviously with the end of the Civil War. And, you know, there was somewhat of a bright light for a short period of time where some African Americans did benefit. Um, but then we're going to look at <clears throat> right now of how things really become 
difficult because the South tries to reestablish the order and really white supremacy uh, for the next 30 years, um, particularly by the early 1970s, um, they, they really begin to push towards um, you know, reestablishing the order that was there before the Civil War. So we begin by looking at Southern terrorism. Now, you know, as, as Americans, you know, we, we don't like to acknowledge a lot of times some of the things that we did. And, and that's why I mean, even today we see that debate in throughout many communities of, you know, we need to teach our kids this history. And it's very kind of nationalistic, particularly K through 12. So by the time you enter college, a lot of students say, why wasn't I ever taught these things in, <laughs> in, high, in, yeah, in high school, in middle school, and so forth, right? And it's just because of the way education works, right? Education is supposed to foster a nationalistic perspective. And in college, we don't do that. We're not there to, to say the United States is a horrible country. You know, every country has its flaws. But we're there to really kind of give you a, a better perspective of some of the issues that arose. And, and like I said earlier, you might not agree with it because we've been so kind of brainwashed to believe certain things. Um, I, I could give you examples like uh, Christopher Columbus, right? Sailing the, the ocean blue, fearing that they're gonna fall off the face of the earth. Um, you know, these are all myths that are created um, to maintain this kind of support for your country. Uh, they have, they might have good intentions, possibly, but for historians, and we're talking real historians, they're very problematic because uh, they end up doing more damage than good. So this is why I, I think it's so significant to cover um, some of these key aspects, particularly even you, you know our textbooks might neglect a thing here and here and there, and and this is where we go to college and get BAs and PhDs and so forth. So some of this stuff might be in your book, but some of it might not. So this is, again, why I, I like to talk about it. So um, like I said earlier, um, by the 1970s, things begin to be reversed. Really, by 1866, right, things begin to be reversed. Uh, there's, a, there's a quick backlash. But, um, you know, we see that many states did not want to ratify the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery, right? Many states, southern states, expected to be compensated for the loss of their slaves, which again, the 14th Amendment eliminated that, right? And many states, um, even though they weren't supposed to, um, according to the 14th Amendment, right, vote uh, high-ranking Confederates into political office, many states ignored that, and they did so anyway. So, as I mentioned early, earlier, Alexander St uh, Stevens, right, the Confederate VP, was voted to the Georgia Senate. So we, we see right away how the South reacted to this new freedom that African Americans had. And here you see kind of like a lot of pictures of, of the backlash that, that happened. So take a quick look at them. I think they're, they're quite key. Here we see African Americans in Congress. And these are political cartoons uh, by Southerners kind of mocking African-Americans, right? Here we see Lady Peace and Chaos, and they're showing African-Americans as incapable of self-rule, right? Um, over here, we have some of the, what I'll be talking about with the Black Codes, where um, white Southerners kind of allow African-Americans to vote, but <laughs> vote in a particular way, right? That or face death or some kind of punishment, right? So the Black Codes um, basically tried to limit the power, the newfound right, freedoms that African Americans had at this moment. So they established what are called vagrancy laws. I think the book does talk about this. But I just, again, want to reiterate some of these key points, is that the vagrancy laws basically limited... Um, people from having rights because uh, they have no employment or because they don't have a, a, a home, 
So right, if you're out there traveling, you could be charged with the vagrancy laws. So even though these laws are established, they're really just um, for African Americans, right? They're the ones who are being punished for these uh, these things. I mean, when it comes to unemployment, understand that you know you could have employment one day and lose your employment the next, and during that window, you could be um, you know by, by you know during that window when you get your next job, you could be basically arrested. A lot of times we find that many of them ended up being fined. In Mississippi, oops, I don't have it there, sorry. In Mississippi, we find some of these laws that are established, and I want to read you some of it, because I think they're interesting as to what constitutes a crime for African Americans. So in Mississippi, in 65, they established the Black Codes. Um, this is December, so you know, less than half a year after the Civil War ended, they begin to promote these laws to limit African Americans, um, uh, African Americans' freedoms. So one law says all rogues and vagabonds, idle and dissipated person, uh, persons who neglect their calling or employment, misspend what they earn, or do not provide for the support of themselves or their families or dependents shall be shall be deemed and considered vagrants. And upon conviction thereof, shall be fined not exceeding $100 with all accruing costs and be in prison not exceeding 10 days. So understand that a lot of these people are farmers. They're not making $100 in a month, right? So how are they even gonna pay this? It, it almost makes it impossible. Now this is key, okay? So I'll come back to this. Another one, another law that passed, in Mississippi, it says, in case of any of any freedman, free Negro or mulatto shall fail for five days after the imposition of any or forfeiture upon him or her for violation of any of the provisions of this act to pay the same, that it shall be and is hereby made the duty of the sheriff of the proper county to hire out said freedman free Negro or mulatto, to any person who will, for the shortest period of service, pay said fine and forfeiture and all costs. So basically what they're doing there is reestablishing slavery, right? And you see it here in this political cartoon here. Uh, the artist is almost um, drawing a picture reminiscent of the slave uh, system, right, where they auction off slaves. Because what these laws did, and, and I read it to you, uh, basically, if again, if you're a vagrant, and, and it, it covers so much, it's it's so vague, right? Um, like, who determines that you're taking care of your family, right? Who, who makes those those rules, um, uh, be, right, being a vagabond and so forth? Um, you have to pay $100. Most people could not pay it. So basically, the second part of that said that the sheriff can <laughs> arrest you and basically sell you off to somebody willing to pay your fine. So if somebody pays your fine, you're kind of forced to work for them. You go under contract to them for a certain amount of time. And $100, again, it's a lot, a lot of money back then, which means you're basically a slave again. So these black laws are established to mimic the slave system, right? Uh, we find that um, children uh, of many of these vagrants were forced to accept apprenticeships and they bound them to these white owners to the age of 21. So many African-American um, parents lost their kids to the age of 21 in some places, right? This is not in every single part of the South, but here and there. But again, imagine yourself being arrested for you know being out traveling and they arrest you and accusing you of being a vagabond and you lose your kids too i mean i don't think anybody would be okay with that um a lot of them had to sign long-term contracts again which essentially equals slavery um a lot of times they wouldn't rent land at least good land to african americans they would rent land out in the rural areas where they can control them where they can do things to them that nobody can see right if you want to be a minister in certain places, you need a, a license. White Americans did not need a license to be a minister. African Americans did. 
uh, they outlaw interracial marriages and you can't you couldn't serve on juries right so all these laws were established quite quickly to maintain white supremacy in the South. Another thing uh, that happens to African Americans, and again, the book talks about this, so I won't spend too much time, but that's sharecropping, right? Where basically you are um, kind of renting land by a, a former uh, plantation owner and um, kind of having to share the profits with the owner of that land. So for many African Americans, this was somewhat of a positive because they, you know, it's their land. They can grow, um, they can work on it on their own time. But this system essentially kept African Americans poor. We find that many of the plantation owners, you know, the property owners, would only um, kind of rent the land if they planted things like tobacco, sugar, rice, or cotton. These are all products that uh, were part of the Old South, but also were cash crops, right? So crops that were um, going to make money. In addition, we find that many of the sharecroppers, you know, African Americans and even whites too, had to buy the seed, the tools, the animals on credit from the land owner. And which means the land owner could charge whatever they want. And so it, it kept these people poor. Again, poor whites and African Americans. And also it could actually, uh, because the black, uh, sorry, because the, the white owners of this land owned the land, they could keep <clears throat> African Americans from voting, right? They can make all these threats and we, we have examples of that. So these are not just theoretical, these are things that actually happen where they threaten the, the people that are renting the land from, um, they threaten them from voting in a particular way, particularly voting for Republican candidates. So we see how sharecropping even though it did have positive elements where African Americans can grow their, their own land, we find that um, it, it tended to also, uh, hurt them and, and, re and essentially kept, kept them poor. Another thing, again, the book talks about this, so um, I won't talk too much, but uh, I'll highlight some kind of key points. Um, you know, these are, are you know, uh, right away, by 1866, we see groups like the, like the Ku Klux Klan being established. These are terror groups. These are groups that are there to intimidate people. Here's another group, I can't remember the name of it, but um, a book I read mentions them. They basically work like the KKK. And you know, most of them, um, many of the participants um, came from different economic classes. Some of them were poor whites, which to them, was a psychological reassurance that they were not at the bottom of society. So many of them joined because it gave them um, some privilege, not complete privilege, but some, right? They could say at least, well, at least I'm not, I'm not at the bottom, right? Uh, but they were also supported by landed, um, um, by the landed uh, oligarchy, right? The plantation owners or what used, used to be the plantation owners. Um, it allowed them, uh, many of them kind of helped fund groups like the KKK. And by doing so, it created an alliance between the rich whites and the poor whites, right? So that it limited any kind of coalition building between African Americans and poor whites. Like I said earlier, in sharecropping, poor whites and African Americans had more in common than they did with with um, you know the landed aristocracy, if you will, um, but by doing these type of things, you know poor whites tend to side with the rich upper class. So this way, it kept African Americans in a subordinate position. So that is significant. Um, Congress did pass laws to limit 
this kind of terror. They were called the Enforcement Acts of 19, 1870 and 71, uh, where the laws basically argue that you can deprive a person of their rights. And <clears throat> we find that many that many of them were prosecuted. But as I mentioned earlier, by the 1870s, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Republicans cannot, um, they started kind of moving back north. Uh, Democrats began to take over. And um, basically, these laws were not enforced. So yes, they did try to um, uh, you know, prosecute them, but it was difficult at times, particularly when the majority of, of the people in power tend to be Democrats who supported some of these kind of white supremacist type of ideals. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> another kind of key form of intimidation and something that begins in Mississippi and kind of just stretches out to the rest of the South. It's called the Mississippi Plan. That by 1872, um, President Grant begins to reduce the federal, uh, the federal troops in the South. They begin to, again, move back North. So everybody kind of needs to kind of fend for themselves now. And we see in different places, again, these kind of groups, these terror groups that go around threatening African Americans to quote unquote put them in their place. So one of them is Colfax, uh, Louisiana, where a large group in uh, 1873, a, a large group of, of Anglo Americans went to this town and slaughtered, and the numbers vary, but there's an average of about 100 African Americans uh, and, and just kill them. Right, it's just it's a massacre. That's what it is, right? Uh, I know there's other examples too of this happening, but it just kind of goes to show how they terrorize this community, uh, so they would not um, vote or or you know try to move up in society. Again, it was really to kind of put them in their place. In Mississippi, by 1875, we see that Democrats and whites begin to terrorize those that sought to vote for Republicans, whether you're African American or just somebody who wanted to support the Republican Party. So they would threaten them, beat them, kill them. And even though in Mississippi, Governor uh, Ames requested federal troops to protect them, um, it, it, was, um, it was actually denied. So we see how Southern rule really begins to take hold by the 1870s. Uh, we find that in Mississippi, um, about 60,000 Mississippi voters who were both, again, black and Republican, stayed away from the polls on election day. All right, that's a large part of the population for one state, right? That could have easily made a, a, a change, you know, put somebody in, in office. So we find that the Democrats end up taking over the state legislature and they begin to rule, implementing their, their, these kind of laws that limit um, the power of African Americans. Or at least the freedom, sorry, maybe not the power. And we find that this concept of the Mississippi Plan, this form of intimidation, follows, um, is followed in other states where eventually it becomes almost an ideological ideal uh, concept where there's a sense of the South needs to regain control from an outsider, right? They see African-Americans as outsiders, they see the Republicans as outsiders, and there's a sense in their mind, really only in their mind, that they're doing good by reestablishing the old, the old system. And this is where the book talks about the, the redeemers, right? Those who are redeeming the South from outside control. Jim Crow. Uh, again, the book does talk about Jim Crow, but I do want to touch on a, how Jim Crow was established. And it's really through a three-prong system approach. The first is segregation, right? African-Americans are 
you know, barred from hotels, restaurants, railroad cars, etc., etc., right? And even though people went to court to fight this, we see that the U.S. Supreme Court supported segregation. And one of the most famous cases is, you know, the, the Plessy versus Ferguson case, where the court, again, this is the Supreme Court, argued that only the state could not discriminate, but private citizens and private industries could. And this will stay with um, the United States for a very long time, right? Um, the Supreme Court, I think it was a, what was it, a six to one ruling or something like that, um, basically allowed discrimination to flourish in this example because it argued that as long as African Americans have equal access, um, not sorry, not equal access, but um, what do you call it? Um, uh, they have a separate, yeah, I guess separate equal access, then they they can continue to practice these type of segregation laws. And throughout history, we find that nothing was ever equal, right? So conditions were always worse for African Americans. So um, this law was something that stuck around till the till the sixties, right? And um, well, you know, basically a hundred years. Or pretty close to 100 years and um if you ever seen that movie i think green book kind of talks about you know how african americans could only go to certain places and they had these green books that talk that address where they could stay and so forth but this just this doesn't just impact african americans this would impact other communities such as asian americans um mexican americans right people who are U.S. born, but treated as second-class citizens. We find that uh, the second prong to this Jim Crow system is disenfranchisement. Um, African-Americans voted, but they were constantly being threatened. So just to go out and vote was an accomplishment, right? Um, but what the Southern states ended up doing is that they had, you know, again, they, they, they pushed a lot of, a, a lot of violence, made a lot of threats and it limited the African American vote or those who voted, you know, Republican, uh, one way that they did it. So this was a legal way to disenfranchise African Americans without by creating laws that did not use the word race. Um, and again, this is what we're seeing uh, to some extent today. We're making it harder for certain populations to vote, right? So we see the passage of um, poll taxes. I think it was first established in Tennessee in 1889, where every citizen had to pay in order to vote. Um, so if you could not afford to pay, then you cannot vote, right? Uh, and they put it at a place, the price of voting was one where poor whites could vote, but African Americans could not, right? So the price of it, um, was, was something that a, a poor white farmer could afford to pay to go vote. But a poor um, or an African American sharecropper could not. All right, so that was one, right? The poll tax, and if all of a sudden you came up with the money the following years to vote, well, you had to pay back the past um, fines that you had, right? The, the, the past poll taxes too. So if you did not vote for five years because you cannot afford the poll tax, well, and all of a sudden, and, and you know. 1895 you could vote well you had to pay for those last couple years that you couldn't vote um, because you cannot afford that that poll tax so instead of paying just say that one dollar now you had to pay six dollars right so uh, again the system is set up it's not using the word race and people can argue this to the term blue in the face saying well it's not racist because it's you know it doesn't have the word race 
Well, it is because the whole pro the whole point of it was to limit the vote of African Americans, right? Another system that they did, and we see it here, right? The literacy tests. Um, yes, African Americans were getting education, but you know it's it's not like they're all getting college degrees or anything like that, right? So, the states passed literacy tests, asking voters to read certain sections of the state constitution, and they had to interpret it. All right. So if you ever read policy, I read in my Chicano uh, studies class, we read uh, the Tree of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And I read some policies that are very simple. Uh, there's one where the U.S. had to pay Mexico $15 million. But it's so wordy and complicated that I always ask students, so, OK, what does this mean? And they're like, I don't know. And to me, it's so simple because I'm, I'm you know, I got a Ph.D. And, and it's not that hard to, to understand either. But um for, for them, they're, they're kind of struggling with it because there's so much jargon in there that they get, you know, the, the, the meaning gets lost, you know, to too many people when they read it. And I tell them, all it's saying is you have to pay $15 million, right? The U.S. had to pay Mexico $15 million. Well, imagine being an uh, African-American with a, you know, second grade education or a 10th grade education. And you're being asked to take this test, literacy test, and to read the state constitution, which which tend to use a lot of legal terms, but also um, interpret it. So, you know, it it barred them from voting. And then the last one was the grandfather clause, which basically just again depending on the state, basically argue that anybody's who's any 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 person's grandfather who could have voted prior to 19, 1867 had the right to vote, right? Well. As you know, African Americans could not vote before 1867, so nobody had a grandfather that could vote prior to that. And uh, so again, all these rules are being created to limit voter participation, making it harder for African Americans to vote. Note that none of this none of this uses the word race, right? African Americans or black or whatever. It's gen generic enough where they can go. Well, you know, it just it disenfranchises. Uh, some whites too, but really the key goal was to disenfranchise African Americans, right? It's racism code, uh, coded in a different language. And then the last prong of this Jim Crow system is violence, right? We see that, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, poor whites who had more in common with African Americans sided with, with um, you know, the upper class white community and in the south at least and um many of them had the help of local government local police which basically look the other way and you know they could uh, have all this intimidation they can kill um they can rape right and there's many examples of that and they could do any of these actions even if they felt disrespected, right? If somebody did not bow correctly or, you know, acknowledge you, you um, if African-American did this, right? You could, you could take any of this action, right? <clears throat> so this creates this massive fear in the African-American community. So again, we see how Jim Crow functioned, not just during this period of reconstruction, but for, for generations. And by the, um, the 1890s, we see the number of lynchings dramatically increase. Uh, I, remember, I remember being in college reading um, you know, about lynchings in, in, in the South prior to the Civil War. And I believe there weren't many. I mean, there's some, but there's not as many because African Americans are slaves. Therefore, they have a value, right? People can sell them and so forth, right? or somebody owns them. But after the Civil War, uh, they're freed men. So there's a sense that nobody owns them. So they have no value. So these terrorist groups have the right to kill them. And we see that um, in 1890, 
the number of lynchings had increased to about 187 per year, which means every two days an African American was killed, right? And those are the ones that are recorded, right? So there could have been others. And a lot of it was psychological fear, right? When you see somebody hanging on a tree, it was to bring fear to the rest of the community. So if you ever listen to um, Billie Holiday's song, uh, I think Strange Fruit, it addresses the lynching. So this goes on for, for a long time, right? For decades um, in the South. And we find that voter um, participation by African Americans dropped about 62% in the South, right? And just to give you one other example, again, how these laws limit voter participation. In Louisiana, in 1896, um, 130,000 African Americans participated in voting. Um, by 1904, only 1,300 plus participated in voting, which means there was a 99% drop in African American voter participation. That is major. So we're going to, um, at least I'm going to end on this slide on the idea of the lost cause. So today we look at these, um, you know, we, we look at the, at the South and some of the things that happened there. For many of us who are people of color, we were just kind of confused because um, many of them have created this idea of of culture, right, of this kind of Southern culture that is based more on myth than reality. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Gone with the Wind, right? It kind of romanticizes uh, the past. And obviously, there, there's a great debate, you know, for some Southern people today, they feel like, well, it's my culture. Understand that culture is constructed, right? Culture is never absolute. Um, so a lot of times we choose a culture, right? We might be born into a particular culture, but we choose elements of it <clears throat> to be part of who we are. That's what nationalism does, right? We choose to, you know, different aspects of nationalism to be part of who we are, which sometimes could be good, but many times it's very problematic because of the way it's, it's constructed. And... As I mentioned, but I'll mention again, by 1870, um, mid to late 70s, you have the Southerners really take over the South, right? And we have, well, I think the book calls them too, the, oops, I, I spelled that wrong, it should be Redeemer rule, right? Basically, the South begins to govern itself. You know, we talked about black codes and all that kind of good stuff. And again, the book does a great job addressing that. But basically, you have a ruling oligarchy, right? A ruling class, a Southern people that are part of this manufacturing community that's being established in the South. But they create a mythical past they, you know, many of them are in industry and finance and commerce and, and the railroad um, industry. But they have certain goals, poli um, poli call it economical and political goals. So many of them argue for small government. They argue for lower taxes. And they argue for limited social spending, social program spending, sorry, and limited education spending. Basically, what they're trying to do <laughs> is get rid of some of the policies that the North established, that the Republicans established in the South. Less spending on schooling means less African Americans getting educated. Um, Freeman's Bureau essentially, you know, doesn't have any money anymore. 
the sense of smaller government really kind of means Southern Democrat rule, right? They don't like the laws that the Republicans are passing that impacts some of these um, Democrats in the South. And they also begin to champion a return to white supremacy. So these, you know, again, the Jim Crow laws, the KKK and so forth, all these things are, are seen as good things rather than bad. And through this, they begin to create this concept of a law's cause. Again, the, I don't think the book mentions this, so I, I do want to talk about it because it's something that impacts us today. And it's key to note that it's romanticized, right? It's constructed. It's not even real. You know, Southerners created this myth to make themselves feel better of losing this war. I mean, a year ago, something happened that you're all very familiar with, and we see how something so ugly that happened in the United States is being justified without any evidence, you know? And, and it's, it's, you know, when, when, when I was reading about the lost cause recently, kind of refreshing my memory, it reminded me of what happened a, a year ago. And that's what's so scary of how they do this. You know, so let's look at this lost cause. So it becomes very nostalgic of the past. You know, it looks at the past through a very blurred lens where it looks at the South as very virtuous, as very brave, as glorious, as dutiful, as honorable, and as chivalrous. You know, chivalry goes back to the, the Middle Ages, right? Um... And it looks at the South prior to Reconstruction, prior to the Civil War, as almost like a, like a Disneyland, like a great place to live at for everybody. Uh, it looks at it as an ideal society where slaves like being slaves. And they begin to basically blame the North for coming to the South and ruining their ideal community, right? And they say that, well, we only lost this fight um, because the North cheated, right? The North had more people, they had more industry, they had more arms, and they were ruthless, right? <laughs> so the, the North cheated. Uh, that's why they won. But we went down in a glorious defeat you know we were brave in this defeat so be proud that we lost and, and again it's so sick and twisted that it's just surprising how you know how you tell lies to yourself and convince yourself of lies right that slaves like being slaves that uh, the poor like being poor you know <laughs> so uh the plantation life was the perfect community with a man at the head of the household and women were you know second class citizens women like that right that's again that's the way they, they begin to look at this and as they get further away from the event right as they get further away from the civil war and from reconstruction they begin to believe it and again to to make connections with the contemporary as we get further away we begin to romanticize it and one way that the south did this was to kind of keep away, or sorry, keep alive the glory of the Confederate by building monuments. So they begin to build these elegant battlefield cemeteries for their, um, you know, their soldiers. Keep in mind that, yes, it's true, they lost loved ones, and, and no one is uh, rejecting that, right? I mean, we all have a history in the sense of, you know, losing people, you know, great, 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 whatever. You know, build them a, a tombstone and, and move on with their life. But no, they went over the top here, right? Um, we see that even General Lee was kind of scared of this, saying, you know, discouraging people from building monuments to the Confederacy, um, you know, right after the, the war. However, once he dies in 1870, 
we begin to see the you know, um, they begin to prop up all these monuments to people like General Lee and and all these other um, what they would call you know Confederate heroes and um, they really begin to flourish during the uh, Progressive Era in the 1900s uh, and forward by organizations like United Daughters of the Confederate and a few other ones. You know, some of them were widows of, of these soldiers, but some of them, again, are just doing it to um, kind of create this notion of this Southern legacy. So there is this kind of Southern um, romanticism that happens where they, um, where they use, you know, poems literature song um literature uh, books and things like that songs art to portray the south as as a harmonious paradise where benevolent masters treated loyal contended slaves with kindness they protected delicate charming women and where everyone revered tradition family and the bible right so they look at the past through what they call rose-colored eyes right slavery wasn't that bad yeah you know maybe some people got beaten but not that many um you know and the slaves liked it they like being um, slaves right it's kind of through that perspective you know they forget to ask the slaves whether they liked it or not right um you know what else are they supposed to um, say right they also um, begin to kind of change the argument as to why the Civil War even took place. They begin to argue that the Civil War was not because of slavery, even though every declaration of war that the Southern states propped up, you know, right before they went to war, addressed slavery as the reason why they're going to war. They begin, you know, again, 20 years after the war, they begin to say, no, it wasn't because of slavery. It's be it was because of states' rights, where they felt I outsiders were controlling, you know, their, you know, white plantation owners' freedoms, right? So they wanted to control, you know, the Republicans wanted to control the Southern way of life. So what they end up doing is kind of presenting themselves as victims of, of this conflict, right? It wasn't their fault, it was the North's fault, right? And that Reconstruction was a form of punishment from the North, um, where they were coming down and taking over the Southern states, right? Somebody who's a foreigner was taking over the South. Understand, it's all the United States, right? It's all one country, and um, this this the lost cause becomes a rallying point for Southerners, and it kind of continued on uh, from that point forward, where many of them are actually taught that. I have a colleague who I think we were we were out, um, you know, we were out at a restaurant. We were talking because he's from. I think Alabama or something. And somehow the topic came up where he, he mentioned that idea that, oh yeah, the South fought the Civil War for because of states' rights. And I just, I turned, I, I turned next, uh, I turned to him and I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> He's like, yeah. And um, he got a little bit embarrassed. I'm like, I'm like, they still teach that? in this Because uh, he's from Alabama, right? And he just stayed quiet. I'm like, I, I just told him, like, I can't believe that's what they teach in this day and age. But he went to school maybe 20, no, actually, maybe 30 years ago. Um, so maybe that's, hopefully things have changed. Uh, no historian accepts this nonsense, but, but it still lingers. I'm sure somebody kind of throws it in there, here and there, right? Um, so, it, like I said, these things that happen in time and, and you know, back in the past still impact the way we look at things today. So, in conclusion, what do we learn? Number one, we see that African Americans do obtain freedom, though it's limited. And again, there, there's some positives, but there's a lot of negative there too, right? 
um, as particularly as we move forward um, during Reconstruction, many of them become second class citizens, even though they have the same freedoms that uh, the Constitution gives to any other person, they become second class citizens. And then lastly, we see that the South um, begins to reimagine itself as victims of Northern and Black oppression. Again, they become the, the victims of this conflict, even though they're the ones who established slavery, right? Or I guess established in the United States during the, um, the 18th century. But again, they wanted to maintain it and, um, and, and maintain white supremacy that um, they create this, this concept of the lost cause. So that ends our, our lecture. And um, so you'll have a quiz to this. And uh, I hope you, you feel like you learned something. And uh, we'll see. You know, hopefully this helps your activity too. So the activity that you have to do, I want you to think of ways, particularly in our last question, of how these different groups could have come together, right? That's the ultimate goal of that assignment. Is like, how can we create a better society? So don't say, oh, you know, people should be given their own land over here and we have our own land over there. No, we all have to, you know, we're all U.S. citizens. So the goal is to live together as one. So what can be done? So um, I'll stop it there and I hope you feel like you learned something.